And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. We're going to have open lines for you for the rest of tonight. And uh, don't forget our Ghost to Ghost program tomorrow. That will be in the second half of the show. The first half, pharmacist Ben Fuchs from criticalhealthnews.com joins us to give us some tips on how to keep healthy. And then uh, we go into our Ghost to Ghost programming. Tom, it's got to be some kind of intervention on that one. George, this stuff is so weird. I mean, depending on what we're using in lines and so forth, we test things. And, you know, we're usually able to work out bugs a few minutes before we even go on, and and nobody seems to know there's bugs. But this was weird. He was on our show eight years ago. He's a Luciferian. He's a Satanist. He believes that evil is helpful and important. And I'm thinking all day long while I'm prepping <laughs> for the show, God, this is going to be tough, you know, because I'm kind of spiritual and, you know, I'm I'm a God-believing guy mm-hmm. and I think evil is bad. I'm right and, there with and, you. And I'm saying, am I going to do something by putting him back on again? Because he's not a bad guy at no, all. No, he's actually a very nice guy. I do have to bring up one thing, George. Just about two weeks ago... uh Kennedy the doll was shipped to Joshua P. Warren. You're going to have to explain what Kennedy is. Okay, so a few years ago, a ventriloquist doll was sent to us to kind of keep from a listener. And we kept him for a while in the offices, and then it was just kind of time to do something else with him. So He looked like Charlie McCarthy in a tuxedo. (laughs) He did. A lot of my friends who have seen my office thought he was really creepy. But anyway, so I packed him up and I sent him off to Joshua P. Warren, who really appreciated having him in his collection. But I've had a few things happen to me, not really bad things, but just weird off the cuff things in the last few weeks. And some of my friends think it's residual of Kennedy. I'm not saying that happened tonight, but it's just kind of weird. It could be. And you've had a respiratory uh, situation, uh, trouble breathing lately, haven't you? Last few days, I, I I don't know if I caught it in Columbus when we were meeting people. I don't know what, but it, it's just it's just weird how certain things happen. But now he's kind of out of out of here, out of premiere. So Josh has got him. So you called our guest tonight, Winter Lake, mm-hmm. to set up the call, and you get what? Well, yeah, we hear all that kind of on his cell, so we put him on hold and we we check out our Zoom, and our Zoom's acting even worse. It's horrible with, with him. With him. And he can't hear me. Uh, did you check your microphone? Da 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 da. And then he, I go back to the cell, and it's just, it's just uh, cutting in and out, and just not acceptable. All right, is it conceivable? Is it possible that God intervened <laughs> because He didn't want us talking about Lucifer? That's absolutely possible. I, I mean, mean, I don't want to sound conspiratorial here, but I mean, it's weird. It's weird, and things happen in life, you know. We can't explain everything that happens. You're often asking, uh, you just don't understand the Big Bang and so forth, but maybe we're not meant to understand a few things like this. All right, well, we're going to take calls for open lines beginning right now. We're going to go to John Truck Driving in Ohio. Welcome to the show, John. You're on with me. Hi, George. I know it's Halloween and everything, but I'm concerned about this uh now that Biden was talking about yesterday, the AI, the AI artificial intelligence. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering at, at what point does this thing, I mean, if it, be, if it is self-aware, it becomes self-aware, it's probably going to want to self-reproduce. Uh, and I'm wondering, and nobody's really asked this question, is there a point in time where this thing might want to take a physical form instead of just being a energy or a machine? Would it? Trying to take physical form as a like an android or something or reproduce that way? John, it's very conceivable that artificial intelligence could run amok and start doing its own thing and uh, acting like its own person. You're, 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 you're spot on. And that's one of the dangers of, of the possibility. The big question is, is, in your opinion, do we stop using it? Do we slow down and try to just curtail it or do we keep going forward i i think they should slow down and be cautious because this thing is a computer and its mind is probably a hundred times it's like playing a chess player and he already knows your next 10 moves and that's what's frightening and the more information we feed it the smarter it becomes and maybe the more dangerous it becomes 
Yeah. Interesting. All right, drive carefully out that way. Let's go to Brendan in Austin, Texas. Hey there, the Brendan. Welcome. Hey, thank you. Uh, happy Halloween, everybody. I'm looking forward to our show tomorrow night. Yes, I will be listening. Uh, I'll be at work, but I'll be listening. Um, yeah, I think God possibly intervened. It talks about in Hinduism that uh, that that directly Krishna tells uh, somebody who's really upset that um, yeah, God, that humans are not meant to know everything and that that's just beyond our comprehension, and we got to let. The higher forces protect us sometimes, but who knows what really happened. But I had um, uh, one comment and one weird story. Okay. Okay. And uh, the comment was about Vicky and Christine and some other guests and callers. Like one time you had a Bigfoot show, and almost every single caller that called in that night was from Canyon Lake, Seguin, San Antonio, Austin, like all of 50 square mile area, all talking about cryptids and weird stuff on the road. And the guests are saying the same stuff. How weird is that? Well, I'm telling you, there's got to be something to it. It could be an area that's heavily populated with these creatures. I believe so. And Whitley Strieber obviously is from this area and we have a lot of caves. And I think that it has to do with the caves, but, uh, my weird story is kind of related to that, and that um, the other night, about two weeks ago, it was like a Thursday, I was driving home early in the morning on I-35. I'm pretty sure Coast was on my radio. It better and, be. It better yeah. be. <laughs> yeah, I think it was at that time period, and there was a weird smoke in the area, and all the traffic pages, like I'm on some Facebook traffic pages just to like keep me updated about what's going on on the roads and it was talking about how multiple counties in our area it was a visual thing it was like a visual notice like hey uh it's mixing smoke and fog are mixing together to make this super fog and it was acrid like burning plastic and the smoke had a blue hue underneath the street lights and i asked my friend i was like what turned smoke blue and he said it was ionized smoke and it did kind of smell ionized it makes me wonder if uh, there are these underground facilities, if they have to off-gas, you know, hmm. some sort of emissions. That, and it was during a uh, temperature inversion, which, like, keeps uh, gases towards the surface of the earth. It doesn't let them go towards the atmosphere. So that's why it was, like, closer down. And I was like, well, that's the perfect time to release these gases because then you have plausible deniability. But – and uh, – Richard Sauter talked about how there's all these corporations that have massive underground co- facilities, and I'm like, they also have to release emissions. So it, who knows? It could be ET or or people, but it happened two nights in a row. There was another night that I was driving home, and it was a, a thick chemical-like fog. It made me think of the London fog. I don't know if you, if the listeners or you're familiar with the London fog, but it was similar to that. But I'll let some other people get on. I hope everybody has a happy Halloween and stay safe, everybody. Thank you, guys. Listen in tomorrow night, Brendan. Thank you. Next up, let's go to Stan in South Dakota. Welcome to the show. Hey, Stanley, go ahead. Yeah, say uh, hi, George. I, uh, I was trying to get in on the last show with uh, Vicky. This, uh, this, this, ha- this happened to you? Office. Yeah. Go ahead. And the... Uh, well, anyway, I, I, this would be a good question for Dr. Wallach, because if anybody could solve it, he could. Uh, Joe, about why people have these uh, paralysis. There, there's probably a combination, physiological, electrical, spiritual, the whole ball of wax. But, uh, you know, I've, I've had them, and, uh, you know, it's, I don't know. I mean, I just like to sleep. And, uh, do you get a, anyway, do, do, do these things happen to you often, Stan? Well, you know, when I was young, I used to have the uh, the sleep paralysis, and then I got into the night terrors. So both things now, are happening now. What I'm having at a, a ripe old age of seventy-seven is. Uh, Morning paralysis. <laughs> <laughs> I'm paralyzed. I mean, you're paralyzed in bed day and night, huh? Well, it's like uh, I'm conscious that I'm not conscious, but then when I wake up, I'm just fully awake, very alert, uh, 
ready to uh, start another day. And uh, see, one of my my uh, theories about all of this that's happening is that as a society, we've uh, we have, we either never learned how to love properly, or we're, we're not doing it now. We've either. And I think if people would just start taking the effort to love, a lot of these problems would go away. That could be. What, what do you think of the uh, Luciferian who couldn't make it on tonight? Well, I'm kind of glad he didn't. I think uh, I think we got so much of that uh, shoved. See, I like to look at the the uh, the glorious. Uh, the wonderful things that God will do for you, Jesus, His grace. Uh, we're, we're putting too much emphasis on the dark. I mean, it's uh, and it affects certain people. It, uh, do you think there was some kind of intervention there? Oh yeah, sure I do. I, I think uh, I do too. See, God is always trying to tell us to do and. See, I, I, we have to be very sensitive so God's will can be done. For example, if if, uh, if God tells you that a little old lady is broke and she can't afford groceries and you pick up the message, then you should go do it. You should go if you can. And if more people were into meditation and prayer, so much this world, our country could turn around overnight. We could be the most uh, prosperous, giving, loving. There's just too much greed going on today. I like your analysis, Stan. Thanks for being on the program. Next up, Linda in Portland, Oregon is with us. Hi, Linda. Hi. Hi. This is so wonderful to finally be on. I've been listening to you since uh, Sandy Hook years ago and uh, the news on that same night was that some guy in China had taken a machete and gone through a school and he went nuts yeah yeah so it's not just guns I wanted to make about three points and I love the coast to coast family because people are out to really get the truth and not uh, cancel each other when we have different opinions so we're a wonderful group of truth seeking people so I used to work as a elections inspector in the state of Washington appointed by the governor and I just want to say, first of all, I really am concerned with a lot of the stories of what happened during the last presidential election. I really believe we need to have a court really investigate and maybe our own people investigate the change challenges that uh, people that are in the President uh, Trump's uh, point of view had made, because I don't think they're, they have been resolved. So that's one thing, because if we would have had President Trump, so many people would not be killed in Ukraine, and this horrible thing in Israel wouldn't have happened. And that, this is my other point, is that I heard today as they continue to find bodies and stuff, one of the people that had, young people that had been dancing in the desert, uh, who was a German tattoo artist, was captured uh, by the Hamas terrorists. Oh. And... She, after being paraded through the streets of Gaza, she was beheaded and scalped, and they uh, put all of that on, you know, so that people could see. And I just think this evil is probably why your Luciferian guests couldn't talk, because I think God is fed up with this horrible evil, and then people in our country have the audacity to uh, take Hamas's side. And, and the last point is... Uh, Every time we have to listen to the news that we get on your program and every program twice a day, everything, every time they leave out uh, President Biden's wanting his humanitarian aid for Hamas, and I think that's insane. If they were living in peace, maybe not the happiest campers in the world, but and then they go over and do these horrible, horrible things to the uh, Israelis, whatever comes to them, they deserve it until they turn all those hostages loose. And oh, that's right, Linda. I mean, war is horrible. I mean, there's no question. Innocent, loving Palestinian people are caught in the middle of this mess. But why in God's name did Hamas have to attack the Gaza area and go after Israelis in the first place? 
as I've said back a long time ago, the biggest mistake we made as a planet was when we formed Israel, which was right and good, we should have done something for the Palestinian people at the same time. And we didn't. And that animosity stayed and stayed and festered and stayed. And then the militants started popping up. And uh, there's no excuse for what they did to Israelis at all. But the sad part of war is that innocent people are getting killed and it's taking its toll on the Palestinian people who are in this small confined area on Gaza and they're getting blasted away as Israel attempts to get rid of the militants. And that's the sad part too. I, I, I would hope that they resolve this and this nonsense of fighting back and forth stops because there's just no question about it. We're going to continue with open lines for you, by the way. Next hour, magician Brandon Scott's going to pop in and join us to talk about the magic of Halloween. And we'll take calls with him as well. So make sure you're a part of the program. And uh, let's talk real quickly to Cornelius and Alexandria. Hey, Corny, go for it. we got a minute. Okay, well... George, I kind of think you're wrong because I read the Bible and stuff. And you know, I'm the God, guns, and gold man, the Bible, bullets, and beans man. And Brandon supports Hamas. So I support the Jews and stuff. If you read in the Bible. Well, wait a minute. When you say I'm wrong, I'm wrong about what? I support Israel too. But what I'm trying to tell you, they teach their kids to hate the Jews. So well, I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying that the militants are out I'm of whack. About the Palestinians. And you see, oh, just at Tulane in New Orleans, they're trying to go after the Jewish students. I don't know if you heard that on the news yet, but those those are college kids, and they here they they've been trained to hate the Jews. That the Jews are all the problem. So there may be some innocent Palestinians in the way, but I guarantee you, most of them, and they voted for Hamas, so they wanted Hamas. Well, I don't think they really understood what Hamas means and stands for. It's not a good situation all around. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with you. We're having open lines this hour because some divine intervention stuff jumped in and took care of the Satanist and was not able to come on. Let's go to Michael in Salt Lake City, Utah. Hey, Michael, welcome. Hey, George. How are you doing? Okay. Hope you are, too. Thank you. Um, yeah, when I was growing up, I grew up in Salt Lake in the avenues, and... We lived about three houses down from where Ted Bundy lived. Oh, my. He lived in, uh, it was a house, but it was divided out to, like, three different apartments, you know, just rooms in the house. I guess they had a shared kitchen and shared, you know, living space and whatnot. And when he moved in, he was a real nice guy. Came to our church and whatnot, and, you know, he'd come out and play football or ball with me and my friends, and... I just kind of hung out and seemed pretty cool and whatnot. And uh, one day he was out working on his car, and he was doing something with his... He had a a little Volkswagen, didn't he? He had a little Volkswagen. It was kind of like a creamish color. And he was was taking something out of the, you know, the inside of the door. He was doing something, and he was taking a chair out, too. Oh, you know, just being a curious 10-year-old, 9-year-old. You're asking him questions, and he, like, snapped on us. He started yelling at us and freaking out, telling us we were asking too many blanking questions, you know? Jeez. And we're like, oh, okay. And he has just, like, fire in his eyes, and he comes walking towards us, and he's gritting his teeth. His eyes are just, like, bright open. Like, almost like he's turning red, and he starts grabbing his hair. And then he comes walking towards us, and we're, like, just, you know, frozen. Like, what's he going to do? And uh, he starts kind of talking to himself, and he's like, oh, it's okay, it's okay. And he comes over, and he, like, puts his hand on my shoulder. Freaked me out so bad. Wow. And he says, oh, oh, it's it's okay, guys. I was just joking. It's fine. And then, uh, you know, we're just kind of mortified after that. So, you know, told my dad and whatnot. My dad's like, yeah, stay away from him. He's kind of a weirdo. And uh, once my mom needed a ride, and uh, he off, you know, offered to give her a ride, and my dad, had, you know, said, "No, don't, don't, don't associate with him." You know, we kind of stayed 
away from him. But uh, I don't know what would have happened to my mom. She would have taken a ride from him. You know, she waited for my grandma instead. Michael, had he already started his spree of killing? You know, I don't know. I know that it's probably about a month or two after the door experience. He had been uh, pulled over in another city next to Salt Lake, Marie, I believe. And uh, he just kind of disappeared. And I remember, like, the the guy, I think his name was Joel or Joe, that owned the house he was living in. He just kind of said, yeah, he skipped out on town on us. And, you know, he was kind of mad because he then stepped on the, the rent. But just a real fast thing, though, they had a... Uh, kind of like a fruit cellar, fruit cellar type of deal. And you know how they have those storm doors on them? Yeah. Okay, so there was nothing down there. It was just dirt, you know, rock, basically. And uh, the guy kept the deal locked. And there was no way in except for that one way, that one door that was locked. And, yeah, there were windows, but they were very small. You had to be, like, two or three years old in order to, like, climb in there, you know, real small person. And when they were out there just playing, and this was after he moved out, but we swear that that door thing had come up and the lock, you know, was bouncing and jiggling around, making weird noises. And we swear we heard a lady crying and saying, no, no, freaked us out, kind of stayed away from the house for a while. And then after we found out, we were just like, holy cow, you know, a kid had killed us, but, you know, just like, you know, Completely mortified, but you know he was definitely an intense and freaky man. And I've I've never experienced anything like that. I've never seen anybody, you know, just like, like pure, just pure evil in his eyes at that time. And he flipped out on us. So and, and he he confessed to killing thirty women and girls uh, between a period of nineteen seventy four and seventy eight. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's kind of creepy. So there's probably more. Probably. I don't know. I mean, he came off as a real nice guy, you know, and uh, then flipped out. Yeah. You know, they say that evil works its ways. Uh, Big, big point. Michael, thanks for that story. It's strange. Neil's with us in Santa Monica. Hello, Neil. Welcome to the program. Oh, hey, how's everybody doing? Everybody's good. Thanks. All right. So guess what? I'm the a guru with ganja and greens, man. I'm a Buddhist with blessing and beans, man. And I'm telling everyone, get ready to go vegan. And I'm not, and I'm not preaching about the end of the world. Okay. All right. Uh, that's called eschatology. I'm telling everyone how we can save it. Okay. Now, with no offense to Mr. White. Okay. Uh, he he preaches es. Eschatology. Is that how you pronounce it? I don't know. It really has a different way. Um, no, so the eschatology is the end of the world theory, right? Yes. Okay. But what Mr. White doesn't take into consideration is that his religion and his surname were forced upon him by, uh, were forced upon his forbearance by the anthropocentric or Eurocentric settlers who enslaved or subjugated his ancestors. Uh, the, the word eschatology was first used by Lutherans um, uh, from uh, in the 1600 to seven, the year 1700. Uh, but um, it, it, the modern interest um, came from the word is anglophone. Anglophone means white Christianity. That's where that's where eschatology in the United States originated. But well, Neil, but uh, do you believe in end times prophecy? I I actually don't because I believe that this is a, a self generated prophecy. Because like I said, like I'm explaining, the, it was uh, the, the the eschatology, the end of times prophecy, came from white. Settlers. Interesting take on all of that. Well, it's it's also in the Bible. It's in the Bible. Let's go to Brian in Indianapolis. Hey, Brian. 
Hey, George, how are you? Okay, my friend. What's up? Oh, nothing. Just working. Went in to do some computer training, come back out, and we got open lines. Open lines for now until oh, no doubt. who knows when. Hey, listen, I just want to thank you and Tommy, man, for letting me come over and help you guys over there in Columbus, man. What, what a hoot we had and what a great time we had. The guests were awesome. And the uh, the guy that won the uh, the uh, costume, the Mad Hatter. Yeah. He ah, oh, and he was so he was over the moon about winning that contest. He loved it. Got his five hundred bucks. What a great contest costume he had. Yeah, put the pressure on me to pick the right the, the winner of the contest. Yeah, that's right. You're the one who picked him out of the crowd. <laughs> yep, yep. I I had a little help, but it it was a tough decision. What did hey, you What did you What did you like about his costume? Oh, just the time and the effort that he put into it. Uh, he, I mean, and, and the detail, even the little teacup and the little mouse that he had, uh, was, was, you know, just the minor little details like that. But there were some also other good, great costumes that I, I had spied. And I went and talked to them people after the show and, and let them know that, uh, they were in the running for, for the, uh, winner. But anyway, man, I just want to thank, it's awesome being part of the coast family. You know what I mean? We like People have always said we got we got good listeners, you know, informative shows. We're open-minded. It, sometimes we have disagreements, you know, like this Israeli-Palestinian thing, you know. But that's just how it is. But uh, we're going to be coming to areas and coasts and places around this country, if if you're able to do it, George, uh, to visit all of our all of our coasts. All of our coast family and friends. We'll get there eventually. Thanks, Brian. Richard in New York. Take it away, Rich. Yes, George. Um, I had the same problem uh, with uh, disturbed uh, phone lines when you had on the guy that was uh, writing a book about Edgar Casey. Hello, you still there? Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, normally, when I start to talk about this, the phone oftentimes goes dead. So uh, in 1964, 65, I'm seated on the front porch of the uh, Association for Research and Enlightenment. I don't know it, but the guy right next to me is Hugh Lynn Casey. And there's a giant lightning storm taking place and punctuating our whole conversation. And uh, he's talking about how his father encountered uh, Michael the Archangel in, in person when he was at a very low point in his life, either in Ohio or Michigan, and he encounters Michael, uh, the archangel, in human form, who tells Edgar not to worry, he's going to chronicle the history of angels high and low in, in the world. That's true. He did that, and he did it in a great, great way. By the way, on Christmas night, which is a Monday, we'll be live for you. I'll be here. We'll end the program with a letter from Michael, uh, that incredible, incredible rendition, and uh, make sure you're part of the program. Lee Allen did it, a great broadcaster out of Michigan. First time caller, Mark in Charlotte, North Carolina. Hey, Mark, go ahead. How you doing, George? Hey, I, hey I'm glad. I'm, I'm glad I finally got to get to, to uh, get in your show. Perfect. And I. And I missed the lady. I missed the lady, but but the sleep paralysis. The, the sleep I, paralysis. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I missed her because I've I've been going through this for forty five years. Forty five years. Wow. Yeah, and I and I still go through it today. Still go through it, and I had my first episode when I was ten years old. How often does it what, happen? Well, it's um, it happens now. It's not as as frequent as it used to be, but it's gonna come back. See what it what it, what it does is uh, it's like if someone scares you enough, you get immune to it. Then they'll go away for a while and come back and catches you off guard and makes you scared again. And and the the one you said that people were dying in sleep, I think you're right. I think people get scared to death and this stuff happened and they're not alive to tell what what happened. Because uh, when I go through mine, I have like two spirits that 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 follows me. One's a one's a strong one and one's a weak one. The strong one is so strong that you can't move at all. It, you can't move at all. And the weak one, you can might move your finger or your toe or maybe your leg, and you have to time yourself, jerk yourself at the same time you move. You can get, you can work yourself out of it. Is it so that's I, that's how you break away. You can break away, but but the lady didn't tell you the, the thing which you can't do. 
You can't lay back down. If anybody going through it, do not lay back down after you break away or you get out of it by saying Jesus, whatever. What happens if you what happens if you lay back down? It'll pull you back into it. Oh, okay. So 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 you got to get up and walk out, get out of the room, go get some water, walk walk around, and and then you go back maybe an hour or two later. Then you can sleep. It won't it won't it won't pull you back into it. But it it, it comes back, and it, even if you say the in the name of Jesus, you could be screaming it loud as loud as you can. But you sound like you're screaming loud, but no words come out of your mouth. Does it like does it scare you? Well, it scares me not not before before it did, but now I got used to it. But now, what it scares me, it pops up every. It used to pop up once a week, maybe uh, once a, once a month. Now it's come every year, not every year, but some years it pop up. It catches me off guard. Once I know I'm going through it, I'm not I'm not afraid of it. I'm not afraid of it. But then I you you can never see you can I can never see no bodies, but I can hear. I can hear it grunting. Like but grunting I got to tell you, Mark, 45 years of it, it's got to drive you crazy after a while. My gosh. Let me take another call before the break. Let's go to Charlene in Pico Rivera, California. Hi, Charlene. Hi, George. How's it going? I'm doing okay. How about you? Not bad. I am so excited that it's Halloween. Um, you know, I'm 53, but whenever Halloween comes around, I just turn into a giant six-year-old. I just... <laughs> What, what do you dress I up? I love Halloween. What, what is your... Either, either it never outgrew me or I never outgrew it. I don't know which one. <laughs> what is your costume of, of choice? Say that again? What's your costume of choice? Um. Well, you know, this year I just kind of just dressed all in black and just had like a skeleton necklace around, you know, and had... I had like a black cape and everything. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't really anything in particular, but but you just have some fun. Kind of fun. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I wanted to wish everybody a happy and safe Halloween, and uh, I wanted to ask you: Have you ever had anything unusual or weird happen on Halloween? I mean, other than this gift thing happening. That's pretty weird. That's pretty weird. But no, not really. Nothing uh, out of the ordinary. Nothing strange. Um, you know, I used to trick or treat when I was a kid. I stopped when I was about fourteen or fifteen. But uh, nothing really bizarre happened to me then. I've been lucky, maybe, huh? Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I I don't know if you've ever heard, but. Um, it might be an interesting thing to do if you can sometimes. Um, you know, all my children, the soaps, they had a storyline where um, Deirdre Hall, um, I forget her character's name, but suppose that she was possessed by, like, the devil in the show. And um, when they were doing the show, weird stuff happened. So they stopped doing that. I had heard and, stuff like that. You, and you remember uh, Dark Shadows? Those strange characters, Barnabas Collins, the vampire, and people like that, they were everywhere. Anyways, we're going to take a short break and come back with Brandon Scott, the magician, to talk about the magic of Halloween. And we will open up the phone lines to give you a chance to talk with him.